Hello. Hi, today we're going to be talking about hormones and how hormones influence the body. So, what is a hormone? First of all, hormone is a chemical secreted by a cell, or a group of cells into the blood, and the effects of, the, of these hormones include growth and development, the maintenance of internal environment, reproduction and sexual differentiation, as well as the regulation of metabolism and the uh, supply of the different nutrients in the body. So the mechanisms of, sig uh, mechanisms of chemical signaling include the following, endocrine, paracrine, autocrine, and intracrine. <clears throat> endocrine is a hormone that is liberated into the blood. The paracrine is between cells or within tissue, tissues and organs. Autocrines are between chemical acts on itself and intracrine is within the same cell. Now the synthesis of a hormone. Synthesis of a hormone uh, usually is transcribed from a single gene, post-transcriptional modifications, as well as directed to the rough endoplasmic reticulum for translation by attached ribosomes. Um, the packaging. How are hormones packaged? First of all, hormones are stored and they are secreted from the secretory granules. Then they are, during the beginning of amino acid sequence, it contains the signal sequences. So then it is translated proteins uh, into the rough endoplasmic reticulum lumen. The prehormones are also known as mRNA transcripts. And the prohormone is the cleaved by peptidase to biologically active form stored in secretory granules. Now, some exceptions. For steroid hormones, they don't require immediate gene expression. They require specific enzymes which convert cholesterol into steroids. So the expression of these specific enzymes is controlled by tropic hormones and or other factors. Um, we also have to take into consideration amine hormones and eicosanoids, which are primarily um, lipids. Eicosanoid is lipids and the, the former, the amine hormones, they are catecholamines. They are formed, they are formed uh, so transport of hormones in circulation. So they are, the steroid and thyroid hormones, they are less soluble in aqueous solution than protein and peptide hormones. And 90% of the hormones circulate in blood as complex bound to globulins or albumin. Now we have to take into consideration the concept of half-life. What is half-life? Half-life is the duration at which the hormone is in biologically active form. Um, an example, catecholamines, the half-life is between seconds to minutes. Peptides and proteins are much longer. They have a half-life of about a minute. And steroids are the longest ones, which have a half-life of hours. Regulation of receptors. So hormones regulate the number of and sensitivity of receptors in target tissue by the following. One, downregulation of receptors, which is basically the decreased number of affinity of receptors. And two, the upregulation of receptors, which is the increased number or affinity of receptors. Regulation of hormone secretion. Um, we have to take into consideration the concept of negative feedback, which is the most common thing. Uh, basically, it is self-limiting. It is directly and indirectly an inhibition of further secretion of hormones. So it basically means if you have excess hormones, then the increase of that hormone product will lead to the downregulation of, of, uh, of the catalyst. The positive feedback are very rare. They are self-reinforcing or explosive. So they directly or indirectly secrete hormones. The positive feedback cause the, the secretion of hormone. Let us differentiate water-soluble versus lipid-soluble hormones. So if you look in this table, uh, on the left-hand side is the water-soluble, on the right-hand side is the lipid-soluble. For the water-soluble, they are, they are found, um, the receptors are found within the cell membranes, and the second messenger is often involved in the concept of protein kinase activation. Protein phosphorylation is used to modify activity of the enzymes. Uh, then we also have control of gene expression through the proteins like CAMP. And an example of water-soluble water hormones include insulin, glucagon, and catecholamines. The lipid-soluble hormones include receptor inside cell. Uh, the receptors are inside the cells, I mean. The hormone receptor complex binds hormone receptor elements. Um, the control of gene expression a, uh, is quite uh, important because this uh, deals with that. An example of some lipid soluble hormones include steroids, calcitriol, and thyroxin.
Um, thyroxine is the hormone that is produced by your thyroid. These are the ones that are responsible for increasing uh, metabolism or maintain metabolism. Protein kinase. What is a protein kinase? It's an enzyme that phosphorylates many other proteins. So phosphorylation changes its activity. Example, phosphorylation of acetylcholenzyme A carboxylase will lead to inhibition. Okay, so signal transduction players. So some of these things we have to take into consideration. The pathway, the G protein, the enzyme, the second messenger, the protein kinase, and the examples of these include the following. So CAMP, the G protein is G8, the enzyme is adenyl, adenyl cyclase, second messenger is CAMP, and the protein kinase is protein kinase A. The example of CAMP players include glucagon, epinephrine, which are alpha 2 and beta. For PIP2, the G protein is GG, the enzyme is phospholipase, the second messenger is DAG, IP3, and calcium. The protein kinase is protein kinase C, and examples include vasopressin and epinephrine. Uh, CGMP, there are no G proteins, the enzyme is guanyl cyclase, the second messenger is CGMP, the protein kinase is protein kinase G, and um, the example is uh, atrial natural factor and uh, nitric oxide. Insulin growth factors, uh, the G protein is monomeric P21 RAS. There are no enzymes, there are no second messengers. The, uh, the kinase is tyroxine kinase and also the activity of receptor. The examples are IGF, PDGF, and uh, EGF. So some water soluble hormones bind receptors with intrinsic protein kinase activity. Uh, particularly, um, I'm referring to tyrosine kinase. And in this case, no second messenger is required for protein kinase activation. Insulin receptor, um, in this case, is the tyrosine kinase receptor, which is found primarily <coughs> in the, um, the beta cell of the pancreas. So activation of protein kinase. Activation of protein kinase depends on phosphorylation. Right? The phosphorylation of enzymes to rapidly increase or decrease the activity. So let's look at this. So we have created um, this, pro this uh, visual for you guys. So we have gene regulation proteins and enzymes. Okay, So we have gene regulation protein, en protein enzymes. What happens is you have protein kinase comes in. The protein kinase comes. ATP, or stands for adenosine triphosphate, will then bind to the gene regulatory proteins and enzymes. Then the ADP occurs. right? Once that happens, ADP is now bound to the gene regulatory protein enzyme. ADP is then cleaved off. Then you have the arrival of phosphorus. Right, the phosphorus then binds to the gene regulatory protein enzyme. Then this is the this leads to the phosphorylation. So what? So we have the phosphorylated gene regulatory proteins. Then what happens is you have protein phosphatase, which comes in. Where protein phosphatase comes in, what it does is it will then lead to the arrival of water. When that happens, when the water bi binds to the gene regulatory protein that has been phosphorylated, the, the phosphorus uh, is cleaved out. So once the water binds to the gene regulatory protein that was once phosphorylated, um, the, the phosphorus is cleaved out. And this process is responsible for dephosphorylation. Okay, So, <clears throat> so here we have on the lower left quadrant, we have the endoplasmic reticulum, which is actually a component of the organelle in the body. So we have calcium that's found inside that. right? So in here, we also have the cell membrane. So the cell membrane, what happens is the diacylglycerol comes out of the cell membrane. The diacylglycerol will then bind to the protein kinase. When that happens, the calcium will come in and bind to the protein kinase diacylglycerol complex. Once this happens, the protein kinase is then activated the activation leads to an intracellular effect, which include the catalyzation, phosphorylation of cell proteins that mediate cellular response to hormones. Okay, so both of the processes of phosphorylation, either the protein kinase and dephosphorylation, which is protein the phosphatase, represent strategies to control metabolism. So let's examine the insulin receptor a tyrosine kinase. So here, what happens is insulin will bind to the tyrosine kinase receptor. Once this happens, ATP is then is then um, ex, uh, ex, uh, is used. Uh, phosphorylation occurs. Then the IRS1 binds, which then leads to be it become phosphorylated. Then the IRS phosphorus uh, receptors will then bind to the HH2 protein and also the HH2 protein P1 kinase. 
Once this happens, the HS2, HSH2 protein will bind to the protein phosphatase, which then leads to the phosphorylation of enzymes. Then the enzyme will then become dephosphorylated. The SH2 protein from the IRS1 second um, uh, <clears throat> mechanism here will then bind to the P21 RAS protein. Once that happens, that activated protein will then cause the expression of genes. Okay? The SH2 protein P1 kinase, P1 through kinase, is responsible for the following effect. Translocation of GUT4, transport of membrane, which is responsible for the effects in the muscle and adipose tissue. So this will then come down and bind to the, uh, the <clears throat> bind to the nucleus, right, and then cause gene expression. So gene expression is observed. So the, again, the insulin receptor, a tyrosine kinase, so it has the following effects. Insulin binds and activates the tyrosine kinase receptor. The intracellular domain is autophosphorylated. Insulin receptor substrate binds the phosphorylated tyrosine residues. And then the SH2 domain proteins bind to the, pyro the phosphotyrosine residues on the IRS. So <clears throat> then we'll talk about G proteins. The G protein stands for guanine nucleotide binding proteins, which are involved in second messenger cascading systems, and they are considered molecular switches. They are composed of three subunits, alpha subunit, beta subunit, and gamma subunit. So here we have an illustration of G protein activation. How does it work? First of all, you have the arrival of the G protein, which then caused the activation. The GDP is cleaved off, right? Then you have the GDP alpha subunit is then taken out. This will induce intracellular transduction pathway. So sequence of events from receptor to protein kinase. You have cyclic AMP, which is a phosphor phosphatidylinositol by phosphate. The re these are receptors, and these pathways are coupled through intrameric G proteins in membranes, and the receptors have characteristic seventh helix membrane spanning domains. <coughs> So again, for the CAMP system, there are receptors for glucagon, epinephrine, and um, yeah, epinephrine B and epinephrine alpha 2. So let's look at the CAMP system. Okay, so here, first of all, we have the arrival of the alpha, beta, gamma subunit. And then you have the adenylcyclase. The a okay, you have ATP, CMP. So what's going on is the ATP ki comes in and binds to the CMP. Once this happens, CMP is activated will then bind to the protein kinase A. Once that happens, the protein kinase A is activated, then you have the activated protein kinase A, which will then come and bind to the CREB. Once that happens, the CREB becomes, ab CREB becomes activated, which becomes phosphorylated. Right? Once the protein kinase A binds to CREB, the CREB is phosphorylated. So this is responsible for gene expression in the nucleus. This is responsible for the continuation of genetic development. So your protein, a, protein kinase A also helps in activating G protein kinase. The PIP system, again, what is it? It's a receptor for the following, vasopressin and epinephrine alpha-1. So what's going on here? The PIP2 system. So the alpha-beta-gamma subunit comes in. So what happens is, all right, this is the PIP is found in the, uh, in the membrane here, and this is the, these are the endoplasmic reticulum. So this is the DAG. The IP3. So what happens? IP3 comes in, binds to the endoplasmic reticulum. This, this causes an effect, which then allows calcium to bind to the endoplasmic reticulum. Once that happens, the calcium comes in and binds to the protein kinase C. Once that happens, the protein kinase C that's activated by calcium will lead to the arrival of the diacylglycerol DAG. Once that occurs, once DAG binds to this complex, it activates this. This will then lead to an effect, which is responsible for gene expression. Okay. So protein kinase activation. What, how does protein kinase get activated? First of all, you have protein kinase A, protein kinase C. So protein kinase A binds to protein kinase, protein kinase C binds to protein kinase. Uh, once this happens, this causes the arrival of the phosphate, so it basically becomes phosphorylated. So this is the response for phosphorylation. So again, how does phosphorylation occur? The arrival of both protein kinase A and protein kinase C leads to the phosphorylation of protein kinase. Okay, so cyclic G CGMP pathway. So ANF comes in, binds the receptor site. Once that happens, GTP is, ex is expended, and then you have the metabolite, which is CGMP. CGMP will then come and bind to the protein kinase G. 
Once that happens, the protein SG binds the blood vessels. Once that happens, blood vessels will dilate. So again, a sequence of events is ANF binds to ANF receptor. You have the activation of receptor converts to GTP to CGMP. CGMP activates protein kinase G, and then protein kinase G causes relaxation of smooth muscle through vasodilation. Again, now let's talk about cyclic CGMP pathway, or this involves nitric oxide. So you have nitric oxide, which comes and binds to the soluble guanylate cyclase. Once this happens, uh, GTP is, is, exp uh, is expended. Uh, the metabolite CGMP is then released. It binds to protein kinase G. Protein, once that happens, it activates protein kinase G. Protein kinase G comes into blood vessels. It will then lead to deletion. Okay. So in drugs that utilize this pathway include nitroprusside, nitroglycerin, and isosorbide nitrate. So sequence events, you have nitric oxide diffuses into the cell. Nitric oxide activates soluble guanylate cyclase. Soluble guanylate cyclase converts G GTP to CGMP. CGMP activates protein kinase G. Protein kinase G causes vasodilation of smooth muscles. So difference in pathways. ANF receptor has intrinsic guanylate cyclase activity whereas nitric oxide diffuses into the cell to activate guanylate cyclase. Again, both cases, no G protein is required. So again, I'm going to end this with uh, the differentiation between insulin and glucagon. Glucagon is associated with fasting and post-absorptive metabolism, whereas insulin is associated with well-fed absorptive metabolism. Okay, that ends the brief lecture on ins and hormones. I hope you enjoyed.